Thank you so much and, and thank you Every Life for, for making sure that um, there's a patient representation on this incredibly powerful panel of stakeholders. Um, uh, is somebody able to bring up, there we go, bring up my adorable children because that makes it easier for me to talk. Um, you know, you may have seen a similar talk um, earlier this year uh, as I spoke to uh, Congress um, and staffers, but you'll see some slight changes throughout the deck, but I kept the beautiful faces and thanks in advance for the, for the families and patients that have allowed me to use their children's and their own photos throughout this um, slide deck. Um, so the impact of COVID-19 continues nine months in um, on rare disease patients. But like mentioned, um, this has been a really unique opportunity where everyday people have gotten to experience something that parents like myself have experienced every day of the last 22 years. And that's a sense of urgency, a sense of fear, a sense of terror, and also a sense of protection. Pictured here is my son, James, who has primary immune deficiency. And so we were wearing masks before it was cool. So I'm happy to sit here and represent as best I can the patient community and, and hopefully do them justice. Next slide, please. So my family, this is where it starts. I have a daughter who's healthy, except she has pretty severe asthma. I have a son, oh, I should have changed the date or the ages on this. My son just the other day turned 22. He's Austin with Duchenne. Max is 18 and also has Duchenne and James with primary immune deficiency. We are a high risk family if you've ever seen one. Next slide, please. So it's important to note that COVID-19 has affected every aspect of life for those living with rare disease. And I've done my best in the next six minutes or so to share with you all of the ways that this pandemic has affected us. I think that we all know it's been a devastating impact, but I think that we need to understand that while rare disease affects every aspect of life, a pandemic certainly does too and there's no end in sight. While the world cheers about vaccines and vaccine developments, it's unclear to our community when we get to go out. My son is uh, immune deficient. It's unclear whether he will receive any productive qualities. When can we leave the house again? And so this is our foreseeable future right now living with this pandemic. Next slide, please. So the first impact that we saw was access to healthcare, and it was in a really horrific and negative way. We stopped having routine testing. And for patients living with chronic and rare conditions, these routine healthcare tests were really important to understand how we were doing what we needed. Diagnostic process was halted for many patients. And you can see we already struggle with the diagnostic odyssey, but when patients stopped being invited into clinics to receive a diagnosis or blood test, it was a really damaging impact. Surgeries were de delayed, transplants were postponed, and in some cases, it cost rare disease patients their lives. Um, we also are seeing an ongoing effect, and, and here in Boston, we're back in the red. And so elective surgeries are being postponed or canceled again. And so we will see the difficulty accessing these things yet again, nine months in. Next slide, please. So with, with these difficulties accessing healthcare, access to medications became difficult. Prior authorizations, clinic visits that are necessary um, made it difficult for people to get new prescriptions. Medications that were used for chronic and um, rare health conditions were diverted and used in COVID patients. And in some cases, patients were asked to just be patient and not expect to have access to their regular medications. The stockpile that I keep of bleach and Lysol and all of these cleaning products, gloves and masks in a regular situation pre-pandemic were quickly depleted and access to these th types of things became um, something of an, an elitist situation where if you knew somebody, maybe you could get some good masks so that when you went to the hospital, you'd be protected. Um, some folks are having trouble getting 
tests for nursing staff. And so they're opting to just not have nursing staff. And that's putting a huge, huge pressure on families to take care of children that otherwise would have been taken by, care of by a team of medical professionals. Next slide, please. Clinical trials are near and dear to my heart because my sons are doing incredibly well with Duchenne muscular dystrophy because they were in a clinical trial. And I can't imagine what patients are facing right now who are in the middle of clinical trials. Um, some of these trials were put on hold and some haven't even restarted yet. We're seeing holds in natural history studies which will impact for years to come the approvals of therapies for rare diseases. People like me are concerned about gene therapy and the gaps in the research that's able to be collected. And we've actually seen some patients who were due to roll over from a placebo onto a real treatment after years of, of really complying with, with a placebo treatment only to find out that because they couldn't get a simple muscle biopsy or because they couldn't get a simple test, they couldn't roll on to, a pro to real drug um, in an extension study. And so, so across the board, we're seeing halts and I have not seen um, things open back up yet. I was hoping that I'd be able to report that, but when I asked around, it seems like things are still kind of in, in flux. Um, and also lots of labs are closed. It's become difficult for families to get labs and if they need to get labs at home, it's been difficult for them to find companies that will actually do that for a clinical trial. It's important to note, and I'm so glad that we have stakeholders from every, um, every arena. Uh, I know that the FDA is overwhelmed. COVID-19 has put a ton of pressure on the agency, especially CBER, especially gene therapies. I can tell from the voices of the people that I talk to frequently that it's hard. They're working very hard and their resources, quite frankly, have been diverted from rare disease to COVID. And, you know, unfortunately, there will still be rare disease when COVID is no longer making such a huge impact on society. Next slide, please. Finances are tough when you have rare disease in your family. Often you are one day or one month or one bill or one disaster from losing the ability to take care of your family. Folks have lost health insurance during this pandemic due to losing employment. It's not safe for many of them to return to work, even though return to work is possible. What if you are a healthcare provider and you are immune deficient or compromised? You can't go back to work and you no longer have a choice. So if you want home care, a lot of it isn't covered. And so you may have to pay out of pocket to have home care. And I actually heard recently from a family that was told that insurance was not going to cover administration of his medication at home. It's not safe for him to go to the hospital. So he's actually going without his medication. The other piece is, is school. School's not in, in process right now for a lot of us. I have four ranging from age to college down to fourth grade downstairs right now educating themselves. And normally my two oldest sons have a full staff uh, helping them. They, are, they have scribes, they have PT, they have OT. That all falls on me now. If I wanna work full time, I have to pay somebody or try to figure out how to do it. If I wanna hire somebody, there isn't help for that. And so the world was not ready for these patients to be at home. Next slide, please. I don't need to tell you that this has been tough for everybody mentally. But our families were already isolated. We're now looking at almost total isolation. I have not had company other than fully masked nursing for emergent conditions in my home for nine months. I'm a single mom. That is not unusual. We only see people on Zoom and we don't have that hands-on help that you need. The care of our children has fallen to completely to us. And that's children, that's spouses, that's elderly family members, that's disabled family members. In a lot of cases, it's not safe to have somebody come in. I have a PCA start and then they get quarantined and they're gone for two weeks and it falls again on me. Siblings like my daughter, Nora, are being affected greatly. She doesn't know when she'll be able to leave the house again. She misses gymnastics, she misses socializes, socializing and she misses other girls, quite frankly. I'm suffering with depression and anxiety. It's crippling. So even the people that are functioning well, like me, are really struggling to me mentally to cope. 
And it's not always a, an availability to have online counseling. In fact, I recently spoke with somebody about mental health needs, and there are some pieces of legislation that need to happen right now to allow people to receive counseling and therapy in home. Next slide, please. Education, services, and care. So we can't find PCAs that are safe. Many people are not isolating to the extent that we have. Um, people are scared to come into our home to provide services. And so it's been just this round ro robin um, of people in our house. Kids can't go back to school, even if school is in session. I have to choose between exposing my son to a deadly virus and getting a break. Um, so it's not possible, we're educating them. The other issue is that PT and OT, as I mentioned, our, our society is set up so that most of the services that patients get are in school. And so, so for some families, they are fighting for access to a school environment, and those schools are just not able to provide that or not willing to provide that. So there's not the choice for every family. There are some families that I've talked to who have children at home that simply can't function at home and are declining greatly in their ability. So patients need to have that choice. The other issue is that gyms and pools and places where people receive therapy are closed or unavailable and people are trying to scramble to figure that out at home. Next slide, please. So I always like to say that we have to learn from these things. Um, as mentioned in the beginning, the silver linings, or as I like to say to all of you listening, no more excuses. Um, and so here are some of my takeaways. Um, this is my daughter prepping an infusion for my son. It's all hands on deck in our house. Um, so it's now possible to educate patients who have hospital homes. So schools take notice. My son James is finally passing eighth grade because he actually receives his education in home and isn't missing school because he's sick. Regulatory flex flexibility is possible and it's necessary now more than ever. We need to try to pull data from the data that we have and make sure that there is nothing that gets in the way of approvals of therapies and that regulatory bodies are still working as hard on some of these rare diseases as they have been, and certainly as hard as they have on COVID-19. It's just as important to me, if not more. Um, telehealth is important. It needs coverage like forever now. I should never have to go back into the doctor for something silly that they can see my kid on a computer screen for. However, it shouldn't be the only option. I'm hearing from patients who need to be seen. And so if you are living with a rare or chronic condition, you should have the opportunity to go into a hospital or a physician if you need to. And now we know therapies can move forward at lightning speed. I'm talking to everybody at the agency. I'm talking to pharmaceutical companies. I'm talking to researchers. We know how fast it can move. You can't fool us anymore. Don't tell us to be patient. We know this ha can happen. With the right mix of resources and everybody's urgency as if it could happen to you tomorrow. That's how I expect people to move forward. Next slide, please. There isn't a slide for this, but I also want to pull to the front of this discussion today, the vaccines. Too few people have provided information to our rare disease community about these vaccines, about how we should handle it. Should my immune deficient kids be able to get access to these vaccines? Is it going to harm anybody if I get a vaccine? If I get a vaccine, can I go to the grocery store and be safe? Which one should I choose? Should I be worried about an AAV vector if I want my kids to have gene therapy later? So these are the questions that I'm seeing literally from my Facebook feed this morning. And I said, hey, I have a call with these important people, so I will make sure to spit that out during my talk. So I'm going to end with let's please let no crisis go to waste. It certainly propelled me to be on a panel with some of my favorite people at my favorite meeting of the year with some really important stakeholders. And so this is an important conversation, including everybody. Everybody on this panel needs to continue to collaborate as stakeholders in the rare community and really continue to work towards our common goal. So thank you everybody and I look forward to the day.